It's been almost two years since I made my first video about adding free local AI computer vision to Blue Iris, and the improvements that have been made in both functionality and ease of use since then are massive. So today, I'm gonna do a full setup walkthrough covering installation of Blue Iris and Code Project AI, cover best practices and general settings, show you how to add cameras from different manufacturers, set up motion detection with AI computer vision, train the AI to recognize familiar faces, and last, I'll show you how to set up a camera to do completely free local license plate recognition using that same Code Project AI software. This is a really long video, so if you're only interested in a specific part, feel free to use the chapter markers to jump around. First, I just wanna be completely clear, Blue Iris itself is not free. Blue Iris is a Windows-only software NVR with a one-time license fee of $70. Your $70 license is good forever, and it comes with one year of free software development updates. If you want to receive the latest and greatest updates after a year, there is an option for a $35 annual subscription, but that is in no way required. The AI portion, which is called Code Project AI, is a self-hosted, local, free, open-source artificial intelligence server that can be run as a Windows service or in a Docker container. And you're welcome to use it with whatever software NVR you want, but in this video, I'm gonna show you how to use it with Blue Iris. There is a 15-day free trial for Blue Iris software, so set it up and see if you like it. And my guess is you're gonna decide that it's at least $70 better than any other free option. You don't need a crazy expensive gaming computer setup to handle Blue Iris, and my personal server is an old Dell 6th generation Intel i7-6700, and it handles 14 cameras with computer vision, as well as acting as both my Plex server and my Home Assistant server. I've got links for my recommended hardware down in the description, but in general, you'll want a sixth generation or higher Intel processor, at least 16 gigs of RAM, an NVIDIA graphics card, a fast solid state hard drive for your programs drive, and a surveillance grade spinning hard drive to store your footage. You can download the Blue Iris version five installer directly from their website for free, and once installed, you'll be prompted to either enter a license key or continue with your 15 day free trial. When Blue Iris starts up, click the gear icon to go to the settings. Give your server a name and then click on the check for updates button. You should be on the latest version, but if not, go ahead and update. At the bottom of that page, you can see that there's a link to download Code Project AI. Click that and follow the prompts to install. That Code Project AI server has all the computer vision models inside of it, so it will take quite a while to download and you'll see a command prompt window pop up and execute a bunch of commands. It will close itself when it's done. Back in Blue Iris on the About page, the only decision that you'll need to make is whether you wanna use the Blue Iris cloud server to keep track of your external IP address for use with the Blue Iris mobile app. I personally only use Blue Iris with a VPN and a local IP address, so I uncheck that box. The next tab is the storage tab, and the top section is for the Blue Iris database. The database is what catalogs all of your clips and alerts and should be stored on the fastest hard drive on your computer. My C drive is a solid state drive, so I'm gonna leave it in the default location. The bottom section will define storage for images and videos stored by Blue Iris. Almost all the files are gonna end up in the new folder, so it should be really large. I'll create a new folder on my secondary hard drive called New Storage, and I'm gonna set its size to 1,000 gigabytes. And I don't want it to delete files based on age, I just wanna keep as much footage as possible in that one terabyte of space. And then when the storage fills up, it should just delete the oldest files. The stored folder is used to protect clips from being automatically deleted. This folder isn't gonna get a whole lot of use, but I'll make a separate folder on my hard drive and limit the size to 100 gigabytes. The Alerts folder is mostly gonna contain high resolution images that have been marked up with AI results and the details of each computer vision analysis in a .dat file. I'll do the same thing for this folder, limiting the size to 100 gigabytes before deletion and I'll create a separate folder on my secondary hard drive. The next tab over is Users, and you can see that there's an automatically generated local console admin profile. We want to create a new profile with a secure password. The Blue Iris user management system is extremely configurable and can limit users based on login time, limit which users can see which cameras, and a whole lot more. But for me, I just want my profile to be an administrator, and since I'm only going to use a VPN to access my Blue Iris server remotely, I want to limit this account to LAN only. After creating that new account profile, I also want to disable the default local console account. The web server tab is next, which is one of Blue Iris's best features. The UI3 interface is my favorite way to interact with Blue Iris because it's simple, responsive, and it runs on almost any computer via a web browser. Start by enabling the web server, which by default runs on port 81, and the local LAN IP address should also auto-populate. Remote access for Blue Iris could be a whole video on its own, so I'm not going to cover it in this video, but I use Blue Iris with a unified VPN, which means I don't need to set up remote viewing at all since VPN traffic just acts as a local network. If you want to set up another kind of remote access, I'd recommend using the excellent remote access wizard within Blue Iris. In the startup section, the only really important setting is to make sure that Blue Iris runs as a service. Not only will this reduce resource usage because 
because you don't need to run the UI, but it also means that when your computer restarts, Blue Iris will start up even if you don't log into Windows. After enabling this option, it will prompt you for your Windows login and password. Even if the username looks a little strange, the password is still whatever password you use to log into this particular Windows machine. The rest of the options are really up to you, your personal preference, and use case. Other profiles, joystick, keyboard shortcuts, macros, and audio don't really have any settings that need to be changed, so jump over into the camera section. In this section, you'll select your default hardware acceleration profile. And this is what I was talking about when I said that a sixth generation or higher Intel processor is the best option, since it was the first generation to have Intel's QuickSync hardware video decoding. In almost all cases, you want to select Intel plus VPP, which means that when you select the default encoding profile during the camera setup, you'll use Intel's Quick Sync video decoding instead of raw processing power. The next tab is the AI tab, where we'll specify that we want to use Code Project AI, which is the new preferred method. And while the previous method, DeepStack, still works, it is now deprecated. Once you check the box to use that AI server, it should detect that Code Project AI is already running. And you can confirm that by clicking on the link to open the AI dashboard. Back in Blue Iris, we'll select to automatically start and stop the Code Project AI service with Blue Iris, and we'll also be using custom models instead of the default object recognition. Later in this video, we'll be covering AI facial recognition and license plate recognition, so enable those if you want to use them. And if you want to use license plate recognition, also go back into the AI dashboard, into the Install Modules tab, and hit Install for the License Plate Reader module. If you have an NVIDIA GPU, this is where you can specify if you want Code Project AI to use your CPU or your GPU, and as I mentioned, you could also run Code Project AI in a Docker container, so you could theoretically set up a remote server, but that is beyond the scope of this video. The only other tabs that I ever mess with are the Mobile Devices tab, which is where you set up your cameras to work with Amazon Echo devices, and the IoT tab where you'd set up your MQTT server to work with their home automation platform. I'm going to skip MQTT setup for now, and I'll talk about it later in the license plate recognition section. When you hit OK, it will tell you that Blue Iris and your computer need to restart, but don't do that until Code Project AI Server is done installing that license plate recognition module. When you get back into your computer, you should see that both Blue Iris and Code Project AI are running as a background service in Task Manager. Opening up Blue Iris again in the AI settings, you should now see that the custom models list is populated. And if you go to the AI dashboard, you should see your three modules running, and whether they're utilizing the GPU or the CPU. Now that you're general Blue Iris setup is done, it's time to add some cameras, and I'm going to cover adding the three most common consumer grade IP camera brands, which are Reolink, Hike Vision, and Dawa. But if you have a different brand, it should be pretty similar. Right click anywhere in the main screen to add your first camera, and give it a name and a short name with no spaces or caps. You want to enable motion detector, direct to disc recording, and if your camera has audio, you can either enable it here or later in the setup. Starting with the easiest brand, Dawa. If your cameras are made by Dawa or any of their OEM brands, including Empire Tech, Amcrest, Lorex, or any other brand that has a web interface that looks kind of like this, then all you need to do is enter the IP address, login, and password, and then press find slash inspect. You should immediately see messages indicating that services are available via OnDrift, and the mainstream should auto-populate. If you have a camera that's made by Hike Vision or any of their OEM brands like Anki, Nellie's, or any other brand with a web interface that looks like this one, you'll need to first enable OnDrift by selecting Network, Advanced Settings, integration profile, then click the box to enable open network video interface and add a user. Hit save and then head back over to Blue Iris. Enter your camera's IP address and the login and password that you just created and hit find slash inspect and you should see OnVIF messages appear and the mainstream should be auto-populated again. If you have cameras made by Reolink, you'll want to set up your camera system with a 1x interframe space and more importantly you'll want to enable fixed frame rate mode. If your Reolink camera doesn't have these options, it likely isn't going to be fully compatible with Blue Iris, and you should check for a firmware update on the Reolink website. Under Network, click on Server Settings and enable RTSP and OnVIF, and take note of the OnVIF port, which should be 8000. In Blue Iris, you'll put in the IP address, username, and password of your Reolink camera, and then change the OnVIF port to 8000. Then, when you hit Find and Inspect, the rest of the fields should auto-populate. The last thing you should do on a Reolink camera is uncheck the box that says Send RTSP Keep Alives, which can cause certain Reolink cameras to reconnect every 30 to 40 seconds and eventually go offline. Hit OK, and then in the Image Format section, you'll want to select a max frame rate that is slightly greater than the frame rate of your camera, and also disable live overlays, which helps reduce system resource usage. If your camera has a microphone, you can enable audio in the Audio tab, otherwise click over to the Trigger tab. The first section is called Sources, and it determines how a trigger is initiated. The most common way of doing that is with Blue Iris's built-in motion sensor. The most basic adjustment that you can make is to the minimum object size and minimum contrast change to trigger. At this point, you may want to exit the motion sensor configuration and hit OK, which will load your camera's live view. 
and after your camera loads, you can right click on the camera and select settings, and then go back to that trigger tab. Now when you click on motion sensor, it will have a live view and give you real time feedback on motion sensing triggers. Adjust your minimum object size and minimum contrast to control the sensitivity of your motion detection. I also set my make time very low, which is the duration for movement, because we're going to further validate every motion event using AI. Object detection is not particularly important, but it can be used in conjunction with motion zones to accomplish specific directional behavior, like line crossing. For instance, if I only wanted to track motion for people walking up to my door and not the other way, I could define zone A as everything except for my porch and zone B as only my porch. Then in object detection, I could say only trigger if the object moves from zone A into zone B. Another option if you don't want to use Blue Iris's motion detector at all is that with some manufacturers you can use the camera's on-device motion detection, in which case you'd select the box to use the camera's digital input or motion alarm, and in the video tab you'll need to make sure that the Get OnVIF Trigger Events box is checked. In this case, the Relink doorbell that we're working with doesn't send OnVIF motion events to Blue Iris, so we'll just use the motion sensor. The next section is what to do when the camera is triggered, and we want to validate the motion using artificial intelligence. Select Code Project AI, and the first box is what objects you want the AI to look for. By default, it looks for people, cars, trucks, buses, bikes, and boats, but you can edit this window to recognize a huge amount of trained objects. The Custom Models field is important since we opted to use custom models in the initial AI setup. If you leave it blank, it's going to check the image against every custom model and use whichever model generates the highest confidence level. But that will take longer and it's going to eat up more recognition cycles, so I'd recommend just using one or two. And in this case, I'm going to use the IPCAM-combined model. The next box is for classifying your results. For instance, in the web interface, you can sort by person detections and vehicle detections, and this just determines what gets defined as a vehicle. On the right side, you've got the confidence level, which is how sure the AI model is that an image matches an object in your to confirm list. I usually keep this above 75%, but you might want to go as high as 80 or 85%. Next is how many additional images should be analyzed by the AI in the event that the first image did not detect anything. Obviously, more is better, but don't go overboard. I'm going to do three images at 500 millisecond increments for a total of one and a half seconds of analysis. I want to fire actions only when triggered, analyze after every re-trigger, hide canceled alerts, burn labels onto alert images, use the mainstream for analysis, save the details of the computer vision, and detect and ignore static images. I'm going to set a break time of 10 seconds, meaning a new trigger needs to happen in 10 seconds to continue the clip, and I'll set the maximum trigger duration for 120 seconds. Next, in the Record tab, you can choose to record only when triggered, which will record in high resolution anytime the Blue Iris motion detector detects an object, only when alerted, which will record anytime that there is a trigger that is validated by computer vision, continuously, which will record the high resolution stream 24 7, continuous plus triggered, which will record in low resolution continuously and then switch to high resolution anytime the Blue Iris motion detector detects an object, or last, the one that I'd recommend is continuous plus alerts, which will record the low resolution substream 24 7 and switch to a high resolution whenever a motion event is validated by the AI computer vision. I use a 2 second buffer since my computer vision analyzes images for 1.5 seconds and can take up to a half a second to do an analysis. I use the Combine Videos option since it makes exporting clips a little bit easier and I limit them to 1 hour or 10 gigabytes. Last is the Alerts tab where you can select which motion events cause which actions. You can also select specific AI detection objects in your alerts, so you could record only for people and cars, but send an alert for people, or record dogs, people, and cars, but skip the alert if there's a dog in it. This tab is super powerful, but it is largely going to depend on your specific use case. Thankfully, there's not much else to do in these other tabs, so you can hit OK and load up your camera. And then it's time to make sure that everything went according to plan. Open up the status window for Blue Iris and you should see the resolution of your mainstream and substream, the type of hardware acceleration, and the frames per second and keyframe interval of your camera. After that, it's time to test motion and AI. Walk or drive in front of your camera and make sure that it responds the way that it should by detecting the initial motion and then confirming the requested objects using Code Project AI. The best way to check on how your AI is working is to click on the AI tab of the Blue Iris status window and then double click on the specific clip in the alerts window. This shows you that the IPCAM combined model took 61 milliseconds to identify me as a person with a 77% confidence rating, which is above my threshold. 
Because that was a positive detection, you can see that the next consecutive AI analysis 500 milliseconds later gets automatically canceled. You can also see that it skipped the frame a half a second before the trigger because I didn't select leading edge motion on the initial AI setup. In this window, you can also see that it didn't detect any license plates and that the face that it detected was unknown. If you didn't turn on license plate recognition or facial detection, then you wouldn't have these two entries. But since I did and everything else looks good, I'm gonna edit the name of this camera to reflect what it actually is. And then I'm gonna add my two additional cameras by using the clone camera option. This keeps all the settings exactly the same. So all I need to do is go to the video tab and put in the IP address of the new camera, hit find and inspect, and then update the main and substream URLs. Now in Blue Iris, we have three cameras with the exact same AI settings that would be great for general use. So now let's set up some extra stuff starting with facial detection. And specifically, I want to add that to my front door camera. The first step is going to be to go into AI and make sure that facial recognition is checked, but don't press the faces button. Next, go into storage and click on aux1 and then give it a new name. I'm going to call mine doorbell faces. I'll make a new folder and I'm going to allocate one gigabyte of space and have it delete after 14 days. Then go back to your camera and back to the trigger tab. Click on AI and then check the box to save unknown faces into the doorbell faces folder. Then you just need to walk in front of your camera a bunch and get all kinds of different angles. For rapid collection of faces, I like to take everything out of the to confirm window except for something it's never going to find because that means the AI is going to be analyzing more images. All the unknown faces should be added under the doorbell faces folder. So then go to the Code Project AI web interface and click on Code Project AI Explorer. Click Face and put your name in under Face Registration. Then select all the files from your Doorbell Faces folder and register Face. Now if you go back to Blue Iris and you click on one of those clips, you can right click and select Testing and Tuning Analyze with AI to see if it properly detects you. If that works, you can go into your camera's AI settings and add your name to the confirm list. Now, when you walk up to this camera, you're gonna get a confirmation that Rob is at the door and not just a person. Using the new alerts search function, you can also search for the registered name and it will only bring up those clips. And using the alerts tab, you can do things like send a push notification when the specific person is detected or skip the alert if a specific person is in the frame. As new people come to your door, they should be added to the unknown faces folder and then you can just add their face to the AI program using the web interface. But for now, don't click the faces dialog in Blue Iris because right now it can make things a little bit buggy. I should also mention that facial detection works great for zoomed in eye level cameras like a video doorbell, but don't expect a panoramic camera to be able to accurately identify a face from more than a few feet away. And the same goes for license plate recognition, but to an even greater extent. One of the most common comments I get on my security camera videos is I want a camera that can see my whole yard, but also clearly show license plates. And that's just not a thing. It doesn't matter how much money you spend or how many megapixels the camera has, the parameters you would use to clearly capture a plate during the day are completely different than what you would use for a typical wide angle camera. And at night, the differences are even more extreme. Not to mention that the positioning of a license plate camera should also be much different than a standard overview camera. Capturing license plates is pretty difficult and positioning is one of those things that you absolutely need to get right. The best results are gonna come from capturing a plate head on instead of at an angle. So if your road is perpendicular to your house, you're gonna to wanna to aim as far down the street as possible to get the most undistorted view of the plate. And if there's some kind of stop sign or curve that makes cars slow down a bit, that can also help significantly. In Florida, we only require rear plates. So to collect every plate that passes by, I need a different camera for each direction. And I place them at opposite ends of my house to get the best angle. I have successfully used a few different cameras for plate recognition, including the Anki CZ500 Speed Dome, the Amcrest 1063 EW PTZ camera, and the Lorita 5241E from Empire Tech. And for pure plate recognition, the Lorita 64mm focal length and 2 megapixel sensor are unmatched, especially at night. Whatever camera you use, it should be zoomed in enough that the car takes up as much of the frame as possible as it drives by, and your camera settings need to be dialed in for fast moving objects, which means a shutter speed of at least 1 over 1000 but the faster the better. And most importantly, you need to set a manual fixed focus because by the time your camera automatically changes focus from the pavement to a passing car, the plate is already gonna be out of frame. You may need to tweak the settings for your specific setup, but these are the daytime camera settings that work best for me. Night settings for an LPR camera are even more unique because you're essentially gonna see an all black image anytime there isn't a plate in frame. License plates have a reflective coating which can cause them to be completely blown out by infrared night vision. So the strategy for recording plates at night is to turn down the exposure so much that the plate is the only thing visible, which results in a clear image of only the plate number. Ideally, you'll want the car's built-in plate lamps to be contributing such an insignificant amount of light to the overall image that they aren't even visible and the entire picture is illuminated by the infrared LEDs of your camera alone. One thing that I didn't see mentioned online is that my particular camera needs a different focus value for when the IR filter is activated. So I'll go over how I saw 
solve that with Blue Iris a little bit later. After you have your camera set up to the point where you can clearly read plates by yourself, only then should you try to set up Code Project AI to do plate recognition. The computer is never going to be better than you at deciphering text. So if you can't read it yourself, don't expect any Hollywood image enhancement miracles. Also on this subject, it's a good idea to have this camera recording 24-7 at full resolution. So in the event that there is a plate misread by the AI, you can just go back and look at the footage yourself and see if you can do a better job with your own eyes. In an ideal world, to get AI plate recognition set up in Blue Iris, you would just go into the settings of the camera you want to use for plate recognition, then go to Trigger, then Artificial Intelligence, and then in the Confirm window, you'd change your objects to Day Plate and Night Plate with a comma but no spaces in between. Then copy and paste those same objects into the Mark as Vehicle field. For Custom Model, you'd use License-Plate and click the button at the bottom that says Only for Confirmed Vehicle Alerts. In my case, I have my camera set to 20 frames per second, and I want the AI to examine every single frame until it's confident that it's read the plate properly. That means that if I want to use my 1.5 seconds of total analysis, but this time for every frame, I'll set it to 30 total images and one every 50 milliseconds. These were my initial settings, and they sort of worked, but I got a lot of plate misreads and even some events where it detected a plate with high certainty, but didn't try to actually read what the plate said. For this reason, I highly recommend unchecking the box that says hide canceled alerts. That way if a car drives by and it doesn't register a plate, you can go back into the blue iris status window, click on AI, and then open that alert to see the details. You can see that per our settings, it only performs plate recognition once the event has been tagged as a vehicle by identifying either a day plate or a night plate with a high confidence level. And that's where I started to run into issues. During the day, my daytime plate confidence levels were above 90%, but at night they were in the 60 to 80% range, so I wasn't getting any nighttime plate analysis if I set the level too high. But I was getting misreads during the day if I set the level too low. The solution was to make two different profiles in Blue Iris. Starting with the daytime profile, we can remove night plate from the confirm window and set the confidence level high. I chose 92%. Then back in the trigger window, I'm going to select profile 2. I'm going to lower the minimum object size for the trigger and then I'm going to increase the detection zone size. Then in artificial intelligence, I'm going to use night plate only and lower the confidence level down to 70%. Now I need to configure Blue Iris to switch profiles at sunrise and sunset. So I'll start by making sure that Blue Iris knows my location by going into the main settings, then schedule, and then I'll click on the map pin icon. A window will pop up where I can select my location and get my general latitude and longitude. And then I can copy and paste those into Blue Iris. Then back in my camera settings, I'm gonna to go to schedule and then select override global schedule for this camera and also ignore manual global profile overrides. I'll select all days, then draw my profile changes around the sunrise and sunset. Then click the sunrise pin and check the relative to sunrise box and do the same for sunset. The last piece of the puzzle is to fix the daytime and nighttime focus issue. Dawa cameras have the ability to adjust almost all their settings using web commands. So we're first going to get the camera focused using the web interface and then grab the zoom and focus settings using this web command. Then we can manually set the zoom and focus using another command. So in blue iris, I'll go to PTZ control, then select custom HTTP and hit edit. Under preset one, I'll just paste in that command for the daytime focus and zoom. Then I'll repeat that process to find the right zoom and focus for night, and I'll put that as preset two. While I'm here, I'll also add custom commands to switch to the night profile and one to switch to the day profile. And I will of course put all these commands in the video description as well as on my website so you can just copy and paste them. Last, I'll go back to the schedule tab and go to the events schedule. I'll add a new item, put in sunrise time, click on relative to sunrise sunset, and then select preset one. I'll add another item, put in the sunset time, click on relative to sunset, and then select preset two. I'll add another item, put in sunrise time, click on the box and select IR LEDs off, and then add one last item, put in sunset time, click the box and select IR LEDs on. Like I said before, plate recognition is actually pretty difficult, and I can't guarantee that these settings are going to get you all the way to the finish line, but they should get you pretty close. One last thing that's currently necessary when you're using license plate recognition, but will probably be fixed in a future update, is that you need to add the custom model ALPR colon zero to any camera that you don't want performing plate recognition. Leaving it on isn't going to hurt anything, but it will Will eat up GPU cycles and could slow down your overall object recognition. So after you've done all this, the next obvious question is what are you going to do with all these plate numbers? One option is to search the alerts window for a specific plate number which will bring up every time that car has driven by. Another option is to pass that information into a home automation platform like Home Assistant using MQTT. To do that, you'll need to set up your MQTT server in the digital and IoT section in the Blue Iris settings. If you don't know what an MQTT server is, I highly recommend checking out some videos about Home Assistant and Node-RED, but assuming you already have a server set up, you just input your credentials, hit test, and then OK. 
Then back in your specific license plate camera, in the trigger tab, click on immediate actions under the when triggered section. Then hit add and select web request or MQTT. Change the drop down to MQTT topic, which can be anything you want. I just called my topic plates. Then in the payload, you'll use a little bit of JSON to pull out the important aspects of the alert, including the plate and date and time. Or if you just wanna send the plate, all you have to do is type and plate. Wrapping things up for both facial detection and plate recognition, I need to add a disclaimer that you need to do your own research about local laws to determine if you're even allowed to use these functions. Plate recognition, for example, is usually not illegal, but in many places it is illegal to film a public road. And laws banning facial recognition are usually targeting use by law enforcement, but often also include a blanket statement for any type of surveillance. In my city, both happen to be perfectly legal as of the release of this video. Another thing that needs to be said is that these video instructions work perfectly right now in April of 2023, but options and instructions might change down the road. I'll do my best to keep major breaking changes updated in a pinned comment under this video, but all important changes will be documented in my website, which you can get to from a link in the description. Speaking of links in the description, I've got affiliate links for Blue Iris and all the cameras that I've shown in this video. So if you appreciate the time and effort that it takes me to make a video like this one, I hope you consider using those links since I do earn a small commission on them at no cost to you. I'd also like to thank all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.